This morning's scripture reading comes from Psalm chapter 78, verses 1 through 7. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. He has established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Psalm 78 is the second longest uh, psalm in our Bible. It's a 119. There's 72 verses, I believe. Um, We're going to start at verse 8 now and keep going. I'm totally kidding, but I do hope that you will um, take time this week and read the rest of this psalm. Uh, it's a beautiful psalm that, that talks about some of the stories of God's people in Israel. Um, good stories and difficult stories. It's a, it's a really beautiful psalm. So please, I commend the rest of it to you. We're just going to talk about these first seven verses today. Uh, if you would, pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. Your word that challenges us and pushes us. Your word that makes us think and struggle at times. Your word that gives us hope. God, is my prayer now that you would speak to your people, speak through me, and if necessary, in spite, speak, O God, that we might hear your word for us this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Rob is uh, on a Wesleyan pilgrimage in England, so you get to hear me this week and Brian Combs next week in uh, preparation for Brian preaching. I don't know if he's going to do his conversational homily style like he does at Haywood Street, but we're going to do some interaction today, so I'm telling you that early. You're going to have to talk back to me today. Just get prepared. So as you all, many of you know, um, we have four children. Annie and I said that we wanted to have a big family. Hey, Lane. Um, and be young, and we were successful, and what that means is that we haven't slept for many years, but, um, and we also have lots of friends that are having children right now, and a lot of times they'll ask us, like, what's it like to have your first kid, or what's it like to have two, or, and I'll, and I'll, a lot of times I'll say, you know, the first was a lot, and the second, but, you know, our third, our third child, hello, Annabelle, our third child, Oliver, was such a great sleeper, Oliver was such a great sleeper. You know, the first two really here, but he was such a great sleeper. And one day, Annie was around when I said this, and she said, what are you talking about? Oliver was not a great sleeper at all. You were a great sleeper. <laughs> Stories are a matter of perspective. Stories are remembered by each of us sometimes in a different kind of way. Neuroscientists tell us that our memories are actually the most recent snapshot in our head of the memory, but not the original memory itself. So when we remember something, we are actually remembering the most recent memory of that memory. One of the things that this psalm reminds us of is that we need each other as we tell our stories in community. Because sometimes, the way I remember the story is that Oliver was a great sleeper, when in actuality, he was a pretty terrible sleeper. Sometimes when I remember a story, there are details that I remember and I am spot on. And sometimes I need for you to help me remember the other details of the story so that we can tell it better. The beginning of this psalm Psalm 78 reminds us that we are a storied people.
people. I love verse 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Now this phrase, dark sayings, I don't know if you heard it the first time, but like that jumped out to me this week as I was reading and thinking and, and, and getting ready for, to preach. It's the only time that this phraseology is used in the Old Testament. As I thought about it, I thought about Jesus' parables, this idea of parable and how Jesus used stories to, uh, to teach an idea or to teach a thought uh, that weren't always straightforward. I mean, remember the disciples, they would hear a parable and they would act all cool when the group was around and when everybody left, they're like, no, Jesus, really, what did that mean? <laughs> I think part of the reason that the psalmist uses the same dark sayings and talks about parables and, and what has happened of old is that the psalmist is reminding us that stories while there are wonderful, beautiful stories that bring joy and hope and happiness, there are also pieces of those stories that are really hard to listen to. And the truth is, is we need to tell both stories. So growing up, we had a dining room. Um, it was the room that my brother and I were not allowed to go into because that's where our china was and fancy stuff or whatnot. But there was also a pie safe in there. The pie safe resides in my house. It was my great grandmother's. I never understood why it was called a pie safe. It neither held pie nor was it a safe. But I'm assuming that at some point someone put baked goods in it and that's what it was used for. Uh, as a little kid, it was always disappointing that it didn't have pie in it. But what it did have in it was a drawer at the top. And the top of this drawer that expanded the whole thing was about three feet long. Inside of that drawer were Polaroid pictures. There must have been hundreds of Polaroid pictures. I, I loved going in there. My brother and I would sneak in from time to time and we, would, we could barely reach it because it was a little taller than we were. We would shimmy it out and we'd lower that drawer down to the floor. We felt like it was 100 pounds. I'm sure it was not very heavy. And we would rifle through those pictures. There were pictures of my parents when they were youth. There were pictures uh, from Halloween's past in our family. There were pictures from Fourth of July parties and fish fries and Christmas and Easter. Wonderful, wonderful pictures. I remember as I got older, I still continued to do this. I loved to look through those. And, and I would look through the pictures and I would ask my mom or my dad about stories around those pictures. And some of them were wonderful stories. There's one where I have a He-Man outfit and I remember that Halloween well because I've heard the story of that Halloween is that after we had gotten all our candy we got to go to the local barbecue shop and we got grape soda. So good. But I also remember there's a picture of a Christmas where my mom tells me that that's one of the Christmases that she and her mom got into a fight and it was difficult for our family. I bet you all have pictures, maybe it's on your computer now, or maybe you have slides, old slides, or maybe you have old Polaroids and you know where they are. And when you look at those pictures, sometimes those pictures remind you of beautiful, joyous moments. And sometimes they remind you of really hard things to deal with. Our psalmist reminds us that when we remember our stories, we have to remember those things that are wonderful and we have to remember those things that are difficult and tell both and hold them in tension. I also love that this psalm implores us to tell the biblical story, to tell the story of God's work in the world and, and I think helps us to see that sometimes we can find ourselves in these stories and can understand these stories is still continuing on as we participate in the work of God in the world. I love these stories because it reminds me, I love this psalm because it reminds me that it is part of my responsibility, part of our responsibility to tell the stories of God. Because that's what the rest of the psalm does, right? So like we have this kind of introduction that reminds us to do this, but then it goes on to tell the story of the Israelite people. The good, the bad, the difficult. So, this is where we get interactive. I'm going to come down. Um, 
if you were going to tell someone, if somebody walked in the room right now and was like, what's the most important biblical story for you? One story, if you had to tell one, what would you tell? What would that story be? Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan. Joseph. Joseph. The feeding of the 5,000. Noah. Noah. Prodigal son. Prodigal son. Prodigal son, got two of those. The resurrection, absolutely. Other stories. Yeah. Uh, I, also, I like Matthew, Mark, and John. The gospel stories, the stories of Jesus, absolutely. Those are great. Yeah. Jonah. I love Jonah. Birth Christ. Christ's birth, yes. I see, a, I see a hand back there. Burning the burning bush with Moses, yeah. Mary the well, Mary the well. yeah. Which one? Noah and the ark. We had another one for Noah. So the interesting thing about a lot of these stories that we mentioned is that some of them are really positive. And then some of them are, are hard to hear at times. So when I was thinking about today in a story that kind of covered the compendium, Judy hit it with the, the Good Samaritan. That was the story that kind of spoke to me this week as I thought about this psalm and what it means. So the story of the Good Samaritan, how's it go? We all know it. There's a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho on the Jericho Road, and what happens to him? Beset by robbers. He gets beaten up as all of his stuff's taken, and he's left in a ditch. Then what happens? Who comes first? A priest. A priest comes first. And uh, this is the part of the story where it gets really hard to preach this if you're wearing a robe. <laughs> Seems a little bit indicting, doesn't it? So what does that priest do? The priest helps him, and it's a beautiful story, and we all go on our merry way. No, that's not what happens, is it? The priest steps to the other side and keeps on trucking. And then the next person that comes by is the Levite. So Levite from the legal class, uh, also someone that probably would have worn robes, someone that would have been set apart. And the Levite comes by and does what? Walks on the other side. And then who's the third person that comes? Samaritan. The Samaritan. Yeah, we all know the story. Samaritan comes, and what does the Samaritan do? Well, who, first, who is the Samaritan? Is the Samaritan someone that would have... Hmm? Not an person. Yeah, not an acceptable person. This is a person that uh, was looked down upon, was seen as other in the world that day. But what does the Samaritan do? He helps. The Samaritan helps. The Samaritan bends down. The Samaritan picks up the person that has been hurt. The Samaritan takes the person that has been hurt to the closest end. There's another person in the story that I, that I was thinking about this week and I haven't often thought of who is the innkeeper. Can you imagine being that innkeeper and taking in someone that was battered and bruised, presumably bleeding? Like what if they messed up your sheets? What if they thought your establishment wasn't reputable anymore? What a, what a courageous thing for the innkeeper to take this broken and beaten person in. He did get paid for it. You're correct. Got two denarii, two days wages. And the Samaritan said that if anything else is needed, when I come back, I will repay you. This is an interesting story, right? Yeah, and he trusted the Samaritan. The innkeeper trusted the Samaritan. It's an interesting story. On the one hand, we have this beautiful thing that happens. The Samaritan, the person in the biblical story that would have been known as other, the person would have been looked at as lesser, shows courage. Aristotle calls courage the first of the cardinal virtues. Shows courage as the Samaritan picks up this person that has been hurt. But then part of our story too is that there's a priest and a Levite that walk on the other side of the road that turn their heads to someone that has been hurt. They may have feared for their lives. They may have wondered if the robbers were coming back. They may have wondered if they were going to get hurt too. But regardless, they didn't help the person that was in need. Our stories are interesting because 
sometimes the most beautiful stories also have some things that we need to hear that are hard. Our stories are interesting because they don't go in some linear path. They're not just one straightforward way. There's twists and turns. There's ups and downs. Our stories are interesting because our stories, even today, are a part of the story of God at work in the world. So my first uh, field education placement, when I was still in seminary, I was getting ready to start my second year at Duke, and I was sent to Union Grove United Methodist Church. I had no idea this place existed, but my first Sunday they fed us. And anytime somebody fed us in seminary, we were very happy for that, especially when it was good home cooking. And I remember I got my plate and I sat down and for the next hour and a half, I did not move. And what happened is person after person came up and told me part of their story. People told me, a young man told me about how he had just gotten his first deer of the season. There was someone that was talking about the upcoming fall football for the local high school. One woman who had just lost her husband told me the story of losing her husband. I had just met her. How intimate that she would tell me that. You know what's interesting? Is that no one that came by and told me their story needed to be told how to tell a story. No one that talked to me needed to be told how to tell their story. They each had an incredible voice. Now, maybe they didn't want to preach or teach a Sunday school class. Maybe that wasn't their thing. But they all had a story to tell and a voice to tell it. The thing that I learned in that 90 minutes that I should have known already is that we each have a voice to tell the story that we've been given. Each of you has a voice to tell the story that you've been given. And part of our responsibility, as the psalm points out to us, is to find ways and see the ways that our stories intersect and connect and participate in the story of God in the world even today. Part of what this psalm teaches us is that our stories intersect and participate in the story of God at work in the world. The Celtic theologian John Philip Newell says that pastors are no longer the holders of right belief. Rather, we are the interpreters of the signposts of God where God is already at work in the world. I think the only thing that Newell got wrong in that quote is that he didn't say everyone. We all have the ability to see the work of God in the world and to participate in that work and to tell the stories of God's work in our lives and in the world. I know that there is chaos around some of us right now, both personally, emotionally. I know that the world that we live in seems kind of chaotic at times. There are shootings, it seems like, weekly. There have been major natural disasters. We have lost loved ones in our congregation. And that's part of the story. But the other part of the story is that God is still at work in the world. That God is still calling each of us to be Samaritans. That God is calling each of us to tell God's story to each other, to our children, to our neighbors, to our coworkers. This may not be like sitting somebody down and be like, let me tell you the story I heard this week. It may simply be, be that we are ready to recognize when God is at work. That we are ready in our everyday lives and believe wholeheartedly that God is still at work. If there is nothing that I've learned about being a part of church, the thing that I've learned is that everyone's got a story to tell. The thing that I've learned is you don't have to have some degree in preaching in order to tell that story. You all know how to tell your stories already. The thing that I know is that you don't have to be someone in a robe 
to see the work of God. So you're called, each of us, to know and believe that God's at work. And when we see that work in the world, to tell that story. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.